Very good morning. Last time I discussed the functional electric stimulation. The first topic today is the magnetic stimulation. Here is some uh, summary of the history of electrical magnetic stimulation. I took it from from the Biomagnetic Laboratory web pages in Helsinki. I modified it a little bit. I start this uh, list uh, by the bimetallic stimulation experiment of Jan Swammerdam, which I told you in the history session on the first lecture. So Luigi Galvani was not the first one to make stimulation, electric stimulation. Then it is mentioned the Hans Christian Ørsted who invented experimentally the connection between electricity and magnetism. That I like to uh, mention as the beginning of biomagnetism in general. So when speaking about bioelectromagnetism, Hans Christian Ørsted is in the key position. I did mention last time uh, the Duchenne experiments well, you know very well Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz. Jesan Bartolo made some experiments and Arzan Wall. I will speak just in the very soon. I don't go too much to the details. Uh, in 19, about the magnetic stimulation, first to stimulate magnetically nerves was uh, Colin and colleagues in 1959. Uh, human nerves stimulated magnetically by Bickford and Fremin. 1965, then Mars and Asa, Irwin and all, and, and colleagues, and Per Oke Öberi from uh, Linköping, Sweden, made some experiments. The experiments and devices which I'm discussing in more detail are made by Polston, Barker and Freestone, starting in 1976, and uh, Barker continued the work then some, something I mentioned about the figure of eight coil. I think the first one to make experiments was David Gohan. Then we made at Tampere in 87 some experiments and Shogo Ueno in Kyushu University in Japan has been very active in the figure of eight coil development. And that's about the history. There are a lot of references here just for my, my use mainly. So this is an uh, important milestone in magnetic stimulation. Jack Darzen Arzenval made experiments in, or published his experiments in 1893. He had a grand solenoid, very big coil. There was a flowing current of 32 amperes with a frequency of 42 hertz. And I mentioned this already in the history session. It generated for the subject inside the coil the uh, sensation of magnetophosphenes, which is a uh, consequence of the stimulation of retina in the eye. Retina is very sensitive to electric stimulation. This magnetic field induced electric current in the retina. And when there was stimulation in the retina, the person uh, felt that he sees seeing some, some white light in, in his visual field, called magnetophosphenes. Here is the real instrument. I took the photograph in the Bakken Museum in Minneapolis. They have one of those original uh, instruments of, or devices of, of Darson Wall. One pioneer was Silvanus P. Thompson in 1910 in Imperial College, London. He did experiments with this kind of uh, double coil system. Uh, the device was quite primitive, but then anyhow, he's uh, one of the pioneers. Today, magnetic stimulation is made in this way. This is very much simplified circuit, but in principle, this is how it works. Uh, there is a 
current source transformer and rectifier, which is charging a very large capacitor. And then there is a thyristor switch. Thyristor is uh, triggered. And then with a triggering pulse, it opens and it permits the current from the capacitor to flow through this coil, which induces a magnetic field with a, uh, uh, with a strength of one to five Teslas, which is really a strong magnetic field. Short pulse, it is very quickly discharged the capacitor and this short magnetic strong but short magnetic pulse induces in the brain electric current. And as I told you, the high resistivity skull is transparent for magnetic field. So uh, there's this uh, current field which is induced here has about the same strength as the current field on the scalp. And therefore, I will show you in, uh, in more detail later on, this is painless uh, experiment, which is very important property in magnetic stimulation. Anthony Barker is a modern pioneer of magnetic stimulation. He uh, constructed these first modern devices. He is a medical physicist at the Royal Hallamshire Hospital in Sheffield, UK. And here are some figures, uh, uh, numbers of, of this. Uh, I think this is already commercially produced instrument. The voltage in the capacitors is about 3000 volts. So that is quite, quite high voltage. Current pulse in the coil, uh, 5000 amperes, very strong current but it lasts only less than one millisecond, about 0.3 or, or 0.5, something like that. You see how this uh, uh, lead coming from the device to the coil is very thick. So the conductor, which is feeding the current from the capacitors in this instrument, the conductor is very thick wire uh, to be able to conduct the 5000 amperes current to the coil. You also see that the instrument itself is rather big one. And the reason is that uh, to produce such a uh, uh, induced current in the brain, which is making the stimulation of the brain, it needs a lot of energy because uh, the, uh, there is needed the magnetic impulse and induction and so on. It, uh, Energy is, uh, well, energy is not disappearing in the, in, in, in the world, but uh, the economic or effectiveness is not so good in this kind of uh, process. Magnetic field, about two Teslas. Induced electric field in the brain, 100 volts per meter. Electric current in the brain is only 0.1 milliamperes per square millimeter and membrane depolarization is 10 millivolts. So you find that there's uh, 5,000 amperes is needed to produce 0.1 milliamperes in the, in the brain. So the efficiency uh, looks very, uh, very low, but that's how life goes. But this is per square millimeter. There is, uh, I found from, from uh, uh, Barker's web page is a, a video which was made to the to the to the uh, TV in in uh, UK about his works. I, I do not show it here, but it's it's available here. Anyhow, it is to told that Anthony Barker, a medical physicist at the Royal Hallamshire Hospital in Sheffield, UK, Barker used a two Tesla magnetic pulse about one millisecond long to stimulate the brain area that controls finger movement. Unintentionally, the volunteer finger switched. It caused a good deal of excitement, recalls Barker. So when giving this impulse uh, on the motoric area, motoric region in the brain above it, it induces uh, electric current to that part of brain, stimulates the motoric uh, cortex, and therefore it sends a motoric impulse to the hand. And due to the magnetic 
stimulation impulse, the subject's hand is moving. The subject does not feel anything. This is a very strong uh, benefit of the magnetic stimulation. The subject does not feel anything, only sees that the hand is moving. Several other kind of experiments, of course, are made, but this is a primary uh, basic measurement, basic experiment. So it is not only painless, but it, the person does not even feel anything. <coughs> I asked, uh, Anthony Barker visited Tampere, Tampere once, I discussed with him and asked that are there any, any, any uh, uh, un, unwanted side effects in the magnetic stimulation and he said that yes he has used it for 10 years and and apparently he has been losing a little bit hair that is the side effect of the system <coughs> so there is no no side effects uh, here's just from one of our publications so not too interesting but showing some of the coils which we made here is not a, a picture of the figure of eight coil which we we designed as one of the pioneers. Why figure of eight, I show you. Here is shown how the stimulus current distributes in the inhomogeneous spherical model. Here is the stimulation coil, a single coil. The coil is rather large because it is a thick wire uh, and, and several turns. So it is much larger than the magnetoencephalography detection coil, uh, but just in the same way as it is calculated, the lead field of the magnetoencephalography, the sensitivity distribution, it is calculated the current stimulus current distribution of the magnetic stimulation coil. Here is a parade example of the principle of reciprocity. I repeat. In magnetoencephalography, to find out what is the distribution of the measurement sensitivity, which is the lead field of the coil, it is fed a reciprocal current to the coil and calculated how the induced current in the brain region distributes. Because on the basis of principle of reciprocity, this distribution of the induced current is exactly the same as the measurement sensitivity distribution. It is the lead field. In magnetic stimulation, it is physically, not only mathematically or vir virtually, it is physically fed an electric current to the coil and it is observed or calculated what is the induced magnetic field and what is the induced electric current in the brain region. Just in the same way. If you would place here a detector, this would be the measurement sensitivity distribution of a magnetoencephalographic coil of this size and dimensions. But this is not magnetoencephalography, this is magnetic stimulation. Physical current is fed here and found what kind of current field it induces in the volume conductor. So with the principle of reciprocity, you find that the problem is mathematically, physically, exactly the same in measurement and stimulation. How the stimulation current is distributed? It is here shown only in the, uh, the, the brain region, but here are shown the current density, iso density, car iso intensity lines. So this is the region, spherically of course, around, of the highest uh, stimulation current density, here around. Uh, with numbers, uh, Okay, you select what is your current here in the coil and then you find what is the current here. Anyhow, anyhow in nanoamperes per square meter, that is a unit if there is 0 0.04 amperes per second to this coil, it is 5,000. 
Then we find that uh, iso isodensity uh, surface where it is one half of that. It is 2,500, it is here. This, they, these are of course uh, sur uh, surfaces, uh, cylindrically symmetric surfaces. This 2,500 nanoamperes per square meter current density surface bounds the half intensity volume. I speak now about half intensity volume. In measurement magnet density photography, I speak about half sensitivity volume. This is the region, the with a with, uh, green color shaded region, is the region where this single coil makes its uh, main stimulation. And you find that on the symmetry axis there is no stimulation, it is zero. And on the opposite side of the spherical model, so very small, about 100 here, so there is no stimulation. And it is tangentially oriented as is shown in this uh, cross-sectional plane. Uh, what is observed here, uh, several things, I just point out one thing, which is that the region, the half sensitivity, or ex excuse me, half intensity volume is rather large. So when making stimulation in this way with a single coil, it stimulates very large region of the brain at a time. It is not focused. Secondly, you find that uh, the intensity of the stimulus current on the scalp, it is 5000 here. I should perhaps have drawn uh, other uh, uh, intensity surfaces here. All, all, also, I limited it to the 5000, which is the maximum in the brain region, but I should have drawn more to demonstrate that there is on the scalp region, of course, also induced current, but it is of the same order of magnitude as in the brain. This is the key point. The, I repeat, the current induced in the scalp is about the same order of magnitude or a little bit stronger than in the maximum in the brain. This means that the current intensity in the scalp is so low that it does not cause pain and it does not even cause sensation. That is, that is the, the characteristic strong benefit of magnetic stimulation. Here is shown the figure of eight coil, which is nowadays used in magnetic stimulation, one of the prototypes from MIT, and just a commercial uh, device. So you see it is rather large because there must be very uh, thick uh, uh, lead, thick uh, to lead the, the current. But this is how it looks like. I show here how the magnetic stimulation behaves with the figure of eight coil. I do not have, which I should have, I do not have a figure of eight coil with larger dimensions. This is just, I directly took a copy from magnetoencephalography planar gradiometer, which is, uh, the coil is much smaller than in the corresponding uh, figure of eight coil in magnetic stimulation. But anyhow, you find that in principle, it is in this region, the half intensity. It is a bit larger uh, with the larger coil, but anyhow, it is much smaller than with the single coil. Just the same phenomenon as I did tell in, magneti in magnetoencephalography, the half sensitivity volume of axial gradiometer or the single coil is much larger than that of a planar gradiometer. Just same phenomenon. And you also see that the stimulation current direction in this region is linear, mainly linear. Look here. You remember this calculation or the distribution of uh, lead field current in electroencephalography when having two electrodes on the opposite side of the head. 
model, head model. If we do an electric stimulation, place two electrodes here on the opposite side of the head, feed current to these electrodes and observe or calculate how the current is distributing in the brain region, the figure is exactly the same in measurement and stimulation. It is either virtually, virtually feeding a, a reciprocal current or physically feeding a stimulus current exactly the same. What you find here is that uh, the half intensity volume in electric stimulation is here in this region and the same on the opposite side. But what you see is that uh, from the density of the current flow lines, that the current density on the scalp is much, much stronger than in the brain. So to obtain a sufficient current density in the brain region to stimulate the brain cells, one has to feed a very strong current which has a very high current density on the scalp, which is painful, very painful to the patient. I want to point out that, uh, that, that uh, man does not feel any pain from current which is flowing in the brain. There is no uh, sen sensors, uh, pain sensors in, in, the, uh, in the brain region. There is happening or taking place a stimulation only if the current is strong enough. So there's no pensation uh, sensors uh, in, in, in the brain. But on the scalp skin, because of very high current density which is needed, is uh, uh, sensors uh, which feel pain and that is painful. That is the story. This is the reason why magnetic stimulation is so uh, patient friendly compared to electric stimulation. This is a key point. Uh, here is one picture of the uh, figure of eight coil. Uh, in Finland, there is a lot of activity in magnetic stimulation. This is from Aalto University, Risto Ilmoniemi, who has been a, a pioneer in this commerce, commercialization of, of uh, magnetic stimulation instruments. There's MagSTIM, is the company which he has been a co-founder. And there is a next stim, another company come from this, this uh, consequence of the research what Risto Ilmoniemi has made. There are made uh, magnetic stimulation instruments in, in many other places in the world. And these kind of neural navigators are made. This is uh, perhaps the biggest one which I have seen from the internet. They are smaller ones which uh, accurately uh, uh, guide the position of the stimulation coils. But this is a very, very big one. Uh, it, it's a Neurocon uh, company in Ilmenau in Germany. So here inside there is nothing than, than the mechanism which is moving the coil to the desired position about the head of the subject. Magnetic stimulation is uh, used in uh, several uh, neurological experiments, but the same principle, magnetic uh, generation of magnetic field and feeding the magnetic field to the brain of the patient is used also in therapeutic use. Uh, having a long time, longer time stimulation of certain kind of magnetic pulses, impulses, there's made therapeutic uh, treating and preventing migraine, headache, and for treatment of severe depression. Uh, the benefit here is just the same, which I said, that the stimulus takes place in the brain and does not cause pain on the scalp. I do not have more uh, information about this, uh, this uh, therapeutic use, how much it is used and what are the, what are the uh, results, but anyhow this is a field of application of magnetic stimulation. Here is just an animation how the electric activation distributes in the uh, uh, brain due to magnetic stimulation. It's an animation, no measurement. 
The next topic is cardiac pacing, electric and magnetic stimulation of the heart. When speaking about heart, I told you that uh, the heart muscle is a special kind of muscle structure which is called syncytium. That's a very strange word. Uh, the point, the characteristic point is that the cardiac muscle is such a uh, structure that when it is electrically stimulated from any point, the electric activation conducts and continues and spreads in the cardiac muscle throughout the muscle, stimulating the whole muscle. Unlike in skeletal muscles, which are composed from large number of motoric units, and each motoric unit is uh, innervated with its own uh, motoric nerve, and more and more uh, motoric units are activated when we take stronger and stronger uh, contraction of the muscle. And from one motoric unit in skeletal muscle, the activation is not able to directly spread to the next one. But in cardiac muscle, this continuation of activation throughout the cardiac muscle is characteristic. With the one exception that there is a borderline between atria and ventricles, the atria form one unit and the ventricles form another unit. And in normal case, the only path for electric activation to proceed from atria to ventricles is uh, through the AV node and the conduction system. And you remember that uh, in the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, there is a bundle of Kent uh, additional abnormal paths for cardiac activation to proceed from the atria, atrium to ventricle. But that's a different issue. This fact makes the stimulation of the cardiac muscle very effective. The stimulation of skeletal muscles, or like the diaphragm in diaphragm, uh, uh, breathing, uh, uh, helping the, the patient to breathe, uh, it needs a lot of energy when it is continuous uh, stimulation of the muscle. Unlike that, in cardiac muscle, it is needed only a single small stimulation pulse, and as a consequence, the heart stimul to, will be stimulated throughout. So it is very effective uh, in the sense of, of feeding energy, electric energy. When Cardiac pacing is used. I think you remember this from the ECG uh, diagnosis lecture. I show you here is the atrioventricular blocks, first degree block, which means that uh, uh, the distance uh, from P wave to QRS complex is uh, longer than normal. Second degree block again starts the activation from the sinus node but s intermittently uh, the activation don't proceed from atria to ventricles. So it is ventricles are not activated every time after the P wave. This is already an uh, indication for cardiac pacemaker, not necessarily the first degree, but the second degree is. And especially the third degree, when there is uh, no synchronism between atria and ventricles, and this decreases the ventricular activation uh, rate so low that the patient, the person, uh, don't have sufficient blood pressure in the brain, and brains don't get the brain don't get the sufficient amount of oxygen, and the person loses consciousness and falls. Uh, uh, falls down very, very uh, probably, or at least feels very inconvenient if the heart rate is so low. So it is uh, not dangerous in that sense as the cardiac fibrillation, but it uh, decreases the 
the, the, the efficiency of the, of the heart so much that it may lose the consciousness. In such cases, uh, the uh, operation of the heart is artificially helped with the pacemaker, which is the impulse generator, which uh, sends impulses to the heart and keeps it uh, working with a sufficient frequency. Uh, the most simple uh, pacemaker, the original first pacemakers, were just the impulse generators giving a fixed rate uh, impulse. And even though the, if the heart returns to normal state, uh, it still gives all the time impulses, which is not needed. Uh, it, is, it makes some, perhaps some problem with the operation of the heart when the heart gets, uh, uh, ventricles get uh, stimulus from the atria and get stimulus from the, from the pacemaker as well. So that kind of fixed rate pacemaker is uh, uh, not necessarily good. And the next uh, generation pacemakers were so-called demand pacemakers, which sense with this electrode all the time what is the cardiac uh, activity. And only then when it decreases uh, too low, too slow, it starts to give impulses to the heart. Uh, the pacemaker, I show you some more pictures of the pacemaker, but the, uh, the pacemaker electrode, stimulation electrodes is fed along the vein to the right ventricle. And uh, the body of the pacemaker is from metal and it serves as the, as the grounding electrode. The first pacemakers were installed here in this region, but mostly the pacemakers are nowadays installed on, on the lower abdomen region. There's more more smooth space there for the, for the pacemaker. I have some numbers here. Again, these are a bit old ones. Uh, I should find more uh, uh, new ones. In year 2002 in Finland, where we have 5 million people, uh, 15,000 pacemaker patients, and there were installed about 2,000 new pacemakers uh, every year. This is more than 10 years old data. One issue which I'm very positively surprised is that even though the, at that time there were so many 15,000 pacemaker patients, there were only two malfunctions per year. This is unbelievable, very high reliability. When thinking that it is in the body, the person is moving very much and, and the electrode is uh, in the moving heart and there is a lot of risk for various kind of uh, malfunctions in the electrode lead and in the electronics of the instrument itself. I, I would say that this is a very good number. Only two malfunctions per year at that time. I think it is nowadays perhaps still better, but anyhow, very reliable instrument. In 2004, there were 2,500 new installations, so uh, a bit more than uh, two years early, four years early, two years earlier, two 642 changes, because the battery lasts about 10 years, so every 10 years or maybe a little bit uh, uh, shorter time it has to be changed, and not only therefore that the battery is running out, also therefore therefore that the electrode doesn't last forever. 30% uh, of these changes, according to these uh, statistics, is made for patients in the age between 70 and 79. Why is that? It is therefore that very seldom younger people will, be, will get a pacemaker. That is a problem of, of elderly people. The elderly people are those who get pacemakers much more often than younger people. So you find that the pacemaker is so common and when it is concentrated on, on elderly people, I'm sure from your uh, relatives, uh, parents and, and uncles and aunts, you, there is someone who has a pacemaker, even you don't perhaps know it. So it is so very common. It is not a, not a rarity. Uh, total number of people in the world with various pacemakers exceeded 3 million in the world 
in 2010. So it is really very common device. This shows the location of the electrode. The electrode is surgically, it is very, very mild uh, surgical operation for placing the electrode along the, the, the vein. It is like the cardiac catheterization, it is similar process. It is uh, uh, placed to the right ventricle and the patient has to lie on, uh, on his or her side in the bed without moving at all for uh, about one day so that it uh, uh, fixes smoothly, it grows some tissue here and it will fix to the, to the uh, muscular tissue in the right ventricle. In this case you see that there is a bipolar electrode here, there's one electrode and there's other one, there's insulation in between. Usually nowadays it is unipolar electrode and the other pole is formed by the, by the uh, uh, pacemaker itself. Some history. In 1955, Paul Zoll uh, constructed an external pacemaker. Here's a, the device is rather large, heavy, and the electrodes are on the surface of the chest, on the skin here. So strong impulse, two milliseconds, 50 to 150 volts. So it was strong enough to stimulate the heart externally. But anyhow, it, is, it was quite unpleasant for the patient to have an electric shock once a second on the surface of the chest. But it is better than to die. So anyhow, that's, uh, that's how life goes. Here is an other example of Paul Zoll. This is a pacemaker where the patient had a the first catheter electrode. So the electrode was placed along the vein, uh, along with the catheter, into the heart. So it was uh, uh, inside the patient. So it was not painful uh, because it was not on the skin. But the instrument itself, this experimental instrument, uh, pioneer instrument, was so large and it had to be connected to the to the power cord on the wall. So the patient couldn't walk longer than where the power cord was extending. Uh, so it was uh, not pleasant, but uh, anyhow, that was the way to uh, keep him in, uh, alive, because then when uh, the pacemaker was uh, switched off or taken off, the heartbeat dropped dramatically in the patient. So this is not for uh, long-term use, it was a intermittent use only. This is a pioneering work. Uh, it is a Siemens Elema uh, instrument, and you actually you can see one of these instruments in, in, the, on the, in, the, in the vitrine on the wall of the Helmholtz Institute first floor. It was uh, uh, designed by, uh, in Sweden, in, in, in Stockholm. Uh, engineer Rune Elmquist designed this in 1958, and it was implanted by the surgeon Åke Senning on 8th of October 1958. So it was, uh, you see that it's very primitive uh, circuit, very primitive circuit. And it was molded to epoxy, epoxy uh, material. Uh, here is the circuit. And it is interesting that uh, it had uh, rechargeable batteries. Here two batteries, which didn't last longer than one day. But here is a coil, you see the coil here around this pacemaker and it was recharged with an external coil during the night time. So this was experimental device but that was the way how it was uh, working in, the, in a very good way. It was uh, constructed by, from two transistors, one which is the pulse generator another one which is amplifier and here are the leads for the stimulation. So, <coughs> so it was fully implanted, no leads were going through the skin. <coughs> Excuse me. This was possible due to the invention and development of transistor. 
transistor was uh, invented in, in the Bell Laboratories. I should have the data here, but I think it was uh, in, in the late 40s. Was it 45 or 47? I should have the data. 40? 47 or 8? Late 40s, anyhow. Yeah, I, I, I should put it here. But anyhow, the reason it was possible to do this, the implantation was that it was working with the transistors. The previous uh, electronics was just uh, vacuum tubes which needed a lot of energy for, for, uh, for heating the cathode and, and so on. They were very large in size. So the transistor technology made this possible. Uh, here is shown just an X-ray from the first patient. The first patient was, na his name was Arne Larsson. He gave his name to to public, and uh, the first pacemaker lasted only three hours. That was a very experimental one. The second pacemaker did last seven weeks, and in year 2000, Larsson had his 23rd pacemaker. He did die in 2001, but not on cardiac related disease. So this is very exciting, exciting issue. So pacemaker, he was a pioneer and he's, he really used pacemaker until 2001. Here is shown Mr. Larson, very vital and energetic. And here are the pioneering uh, gentlemen, engineer Rune Elmquist, surgeon Oke Senning and patient Arne Larson. That was in Karolinska Institute in, in Stockholm. But there's another pioneer, Wilson Greatbach, in the in, in, uh, United States. He, he was in, in Buffalo, New York. And he developed a pacemaker working with transistors. And he implanted that to an animal half a year earlier. It was the same year, uh, 7th of uh, May. So in that sense, he was actually the, the real pioneer making the first implantation, but that was an animal experiment. So the human implantation with his pacemaker was made uh, two years later in June 1960. Anyhow, these two groups were very uh, important pioneers in pacemaker technology. This is from the second International Conference on Bioelectromagnetism in Melbourne where he gave an uh, opening uh, uh, presentation or, or, or about, the, about the, his uh, uh, pacemaker development. Here are just some examples of pacemaker that is a very old one. You see that this is uh, constructed with a discrete components and most of the space or the volume of the pacemaker is just uh, from these batteries. And here are how the modern pacemakers look like. The, sing, uh, the, the simple uh, pacemaking system is, as I mentioned, a catheter going to the right ventricle, unipolar electrode, and the, the references, the cover of, of the pacemaker. There are other kind of pacemakers, electrode systems as well. It may sound a bit unphysiological that the ventricles are paced with a pacemaker without uh, taking into account the operation of the atria. So there is no synchronism which decreases the maximum output of the heart about 20-30%, uh, but it makes the system very simple. There do exist also double chamber pacing systems, one electrode pacing the atria and other one the ventricles. This sounds very physiological. They are just synchronously in synchronism as in normal operation, but this is not very common. And I think the one of the reasons, just a question of, of costs as well, but also, this is a bit more or, or quite much more sensitive to external noises as, uh, and disturbances as a single electrode system. Uh, a pioneering uh, company in producing pacemakers uh, was uh, or is the Medtronic in, in Minneapolis. 
and this is the typical story of, of, uh, of, of foundation of uh, industry, in, especially in the United States. Mr. Earl Bakken is in the family garage. Uh, his hobby is electronics and started to do different kind of uh, electronic devices. And with his brother-in-law, Palmer Hermundsley, he co-founded co Medronic in 1949 in the garage of northeast Minneapolis. This is the beginning of, of the Medtronic company. That is just similar, that's the beginning of the Microsoft uh, uh, company, which is in the world scale, world scale one of the biggest companies. That's how they started. In interesting pioneering uh, photographs. Mr. Earl Backen, uh, he was born in 1924. He is shown here in this picture with Russ Medal, a very honor, great honor which he received, and his first pacemaker. And I did show in my first lecture in the history uh, lecture several uh, pictures which I had taken in the Backen Library and Museum. Uh, Earl Backen founded uh, close to the min city of Minneapolis center, it does not the center, but a little bit outside this Bakken Library and Museum, where he, there's an excellent collection of electromedical devices and a library of uh, original publications. I show you some pictures on how the pacemaker is uh, changed. These are very old ones. I was at Helsinki University Central Hospital in in, in, in cardiological laboratory as an engineer uh, from 72 to 74. That's quite a long time ago. I took then some photographs there, but in principle the changing of the pacemaker looks the same today, but I'll show you some pictures here. So the pacemaker has to be changed at least every 10 years, as I told, because of the battery is running out. There may be some other reasons also for that. Uh, and here is shown the the patient is uh, uh, not in anesthesia, just some sedative uh, medicine given. Uh, it is given some, some uh, uh, anesthetics uh, by the anesthesiologist here. There is a, a defibrillator in case it is needed, a very old model because that is in 73, I think I took the photographs. Uh, the pacemaker is seen here under the skin. The old one, it is uh, cut with a surgical knife and opened. And the old pacemaker is here, it is taken off. And then the new pacemaker is uh, placed and then it is uh, sutured, the, the, the wound closed. And finally, when the new pacemaker is installed, this is a demand type pacemaker. There is a switch read relay in the pacemaker so that when placing a, a, a permanent magnet, magnet above the pacemaker it closes the relay and makes it to operate because if the heart is running normally at this instant of time the pacemaker doesn't work. So with this it is forced to work so it can be checked that it is, it is working properly. The next topic is cardiac defibrillation. Uh, the mechanisms of defibrillation, there's some, some uh, uh, speculation and analysis. This is one way, here is a cardiac muscle tissue. When it is stimulated, the, stimu the depolarization proceeds uh, along the cardiac muscle and it uh, they meet here on the other side and then because it cannot be depolarized just immediately uh, the activation will uh, stop here. But if here is a region due to for instance uh, an infarct uh, the activation proceeds only to that infarcted region cannot go further on and it proceeds this way longer time and then therefore here starts to be repolarized tissue in this region so this activation which is coming here may depolarize again the tissue and the 
cardiac muscle may start uh, fibrillation. Uh, I did show you this picture, I show you again. When there is uh, fibrillation in the cardiac muscle, the ECG looks like that. And here is a dog experiment. Due to the fibrillation, the blood pressure decreases very soon because the heart is not, uh, muscle is not uh, activating synchronously in the ventricles because it is fibrillating the net volume of the ventricles doesn't change so that it doesn't pump, it doesn't pump blood. The very fast uh, decrease of the blood pressure causes immediate consciousness of the patient, patient falls down and uh, there is not too much time to save the life of the patient. Uh, it, uh, it is said that the fibrillation has to be uh, discontinued very soon, every minute in, 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 in delay decreases the survival uh, of the patient with 10% units. So after 10 minutes, there's not too much hope anymore. Here's the first, historically, the first defibrillator by Claude Beck in 1947, intended for uh, uh, open chest defibrillator during surgical operation, not trans chest uh, on, on the skin. So this is, here are the electrodes, they, they look like spoons, maybe that they are really built from, from spoons, I'm not sure, but they're placed on the, directly on the surface of the heart to cause a strong stimulation from the instrument to make all the heart muscle depolarized whereafter it starts hopefully to beat. Uh, in 1956 Paul Zoll used more powerful unit to perform the first closed chest defibrillation. So here the electrodes were placed on the skin, on the thorax, with a stronger current uh, made the uh, defibrillation. In Belfast, ambulance transported physicians first achieved pre-hospital defibrillation in 1966, and uh, defibrillation by emergency medical technicians without presence of physicians was first performed in Oregon in 1969. So open chest defibrillation is shown here. This can be done, of course, only if there is going on surgery. Uh, if the patient is just falling down and, and, and uh, uh, there's a, because of defibrillation, uh, because of fibrillation, there is no time to start opening the chest. No, not at all. This is in surgical, during surgical operation. Here it is shown how the external closed chest defibrillation is made. The defibrillation electrodes are placed uh, on the chest so that the current from the electrodes is passing through the heart. And in the trans chest defibrillation, energy is about 200 to 360 joules. Current is 24 amperes for about 20 millisecond time. Voltage is five kilovolts in monophasic and two kilovolts in biphasic stimulation. The impedance between these electrodes is about 50 ohms. It's very strong pulse. Some uh, photographs of defibrillators, some that's a bit older one. Uh, here is an example. This is not a real patient. This is a mannequin. Uh, some Medtronic defibrillators shown here, these devices. This is exciting biomedical engineering development. Automated external defibrillator. Does anyone know this? Have you seen this? Who has seen? AED? No one? Okay, I know that you have seen it. <laughs> I, uh, I'll show you. This is, this is important. This is really exciting, important. So, majority of sudden cardiac deaths occur elsewhere than in hospitals or in presence of doctors. Of course, wherever. Cardiac fibrillation or tachycardia must be discontinued within 
one to four minutes. Even in urban environment, the arrival of prof professional help takes at least five minutes. Of course, as you know. The first large-scale experiment of lay people defibrillation started in Australia, 1991, in airports and Qantas airline company airplanes. Conclusion was that combining layperson defibrillator to traditional cardiopulmonary resuscitation doubles the survival of out of hospital cardiac arrest patients. Uh, you may find from uh, uh, aedgrant.com uh, web page uh, information of various uh, uh, these kind of devices. Uh, and uh, in USA, about, uh, there is about 325,000 cases annually. 13 devices are in uh, where, where the cardiac arrest takes place. 13 devices uh, are already at San Francisco airport and 1.5 million devices in the USA altogether. Uh, this uh, website I took from, from Kansai Internal Airport about the instrument, and it is seen like this. This is a Tokyo Oimachi metro station. This kind of uh, system on the metro station, and inside there is this AED instrument. Uh, there is text in English, Chinese, and Korean. And the station staff is trained to use this. I'll tell you a bit more about this. Here is another device, also I took in Tokyo Inari Cho metro station picture of this. You know what is this place? There is in Helmholtz Institute in, in the lobby. There is one instrument as it should be. Please go to see it. I don't know if it has been needed, but it's very important if needed. Here is uh, just some story. This is from the department store in uh, just in Tampere, whichever, but in Stockman department store in, in Tampere. The janitor shows the instrument and shows the advice how the electrodes are placed to the patient. The defibrillator gives advice in pre-selected language. It checks whether the patient has ventricular fibrillation or tachycardia. Defibrillation is repeated two times if needed. The prognosis decreases 10% unit for every minute. Cases are about, exist uh, about 80 per 100,000 uh, inhabitants, so there are uh, annually 4,000 cases in Finland. The price for the device uh, uh, varies from 1.5 thousand to 4,000 euros. Uh, in w some old data here, Helsinki railway station had it first in 1998 and Helsinki airport. Autumn 2004, in, there were 25 devices in Finland. Uh, I'll show you a video. This is the instrument. I hope this video works. They don't usually work, but I, let's see if I succeed. Finally, an automated external defibrillator designed for real world use. Sudden cardiac arrest can strike anyone, anywhere, at any time. In North America, it kills 10 times more people than car accidents. The only cure is early defibrillation. At last, the revolutionary design of the DefibTech Lifeline AED makes life-saving defibrillation an affordable reality. The Lifeline AED is designed for simplicity. Once the AED is turned on, clear voice prompts and brightly lit progress lights guide the user step-by-step -step from applying pre-connected pads through delivering a shock. Analyzing heart rhythm. Do not touch the patient. Shock advised. Charging. Stand clear. Press flashing shock button. Shock 1 delivered. It is safe to touch the patient. Begin CPR now. The Lifeline AED is designed for the real world. Oversized lit buttons, pre-connected pads stored in the unit, rubberized surfaces for a sure grip. So that was certainly a mannequin, not a real case. But you see that the device 
like from the lobby of Helmholtz Institute, has to be, okay, when, when the person suddenly falls down, loses consciousness, it is uh, probable that the patient has uh, cardiac fibrillation. Then it is taken, this instrument, just from the cabin on the wall, connected the pads on the chest, taking the clothes away, connected to the chest, as it is advised. The instrument detects, records ECG, detects whether there is a fibrillation. If there is fibrillation, it advises to give the defibrillation shock. If the first shock helps to defibrillate the heart, then everything is fine. It may be given another one or perhaps a third one and, and hopefully it finally helps. But anyhow, this is interesting biomedical engineering instrument because it can be used by layman. I mean that anyone may use it because it is very, uh, very easy to use and there is excellent guidance given in the pre-selected language. And the success with this instrument is very high. It has saved a lot of lives. And I'm really happy to see that in, in Helmholtz Institute uh, lobby there is one and everyone in the Institute should be uh, taught and, and practice to use it. I do not know how many such instruments are in other buildings of, of this university. There do exist also implantable defibrillators for patients who have the tendency to get uh, cardiac fibrillation. It is kind of, looks very much similar as a cardiac pacemaker, it's a bit larger. Electrodes are two electrodes placed to the uh, heart, to, to ventricle and, and atria. And because it is electrodes are inside the heart, it does not need so much energy as the external defibrillator to, produ to uh, produce the defib defibrillation. Transcardiac impedance is about 20 ohms, voltage is 30 volts only. You see that it is much lower. Energy is 30 joules. Quite much these have been installed. I should have here uh, more recent data because they certainly, the number of installations per year has been increased. In the year 2000, in Finland were installed 134 de uh, implanted de de defibrillators. I think it's quite a large number. Uh, for the patient who, or person who has the implant the defibrillator and who gets the uh, uh, defibrillation shock, it is of course not so very pleasant, but it is uh, uh, the alternative for being, being killed by the fibrillation. So it is that's a life-saving life procedure. I go to next to the impedance spreadismography, measurement of the intrinsic electric properties of biological tissues. I have two chapters here on the uh, impedance. I have chapter of impedance cardiography, which I'm able to lecture today. And next week I will speak about the impedance tomography. Biologic basis of impedance platysmography. Platysmography means measurement of, of volume changes. David Gezelovich, who is a pioneer of, of finding the equations for bioelectric and magnetic phenomena, developed or derived the equations for impedance measurement as, self, as, uh, uh, as well. As you remember, he is the scientist who wrote the equations for uh, bioelectric field. He also wrote a few years later the equation for biomagnetic field and then a few years later he wrote the equations for the impedance measurement. So very excellent work. Here is the volume conductor having the conductivity sigma which uh, is uh, uh, varying from uh, as a find, uh, a function of location and function of time. The volu volume conductor conductivity sigma is function of location and time, as I write here. 
uh, impedance is measured so that typically that with a pair of electrodes it is fed a current physically fed a current it is not a virtual current but physically fed a current to the body and with another pair of electrodes and the uh, amplifier it is measured the voltage and here are shown the physical current distribution which is the same as the lead field for these current electrodes and this is the lead field for the voltage measurement electrodes. The equation which Gezelovic derived is this one and it describes how the macroscopic resistivity Z, which is an impedance per unit volume, is derived from the spatial distribution of conductivity sigma, weighted by the dot product of the lead fields of the voltage and current leads. This is the equation. Because it is weighted by the dot product of these two leads, one is a physical current field and other one is the lead field but anyhow these leads there's some very special property in this region where these two fields are parallel the measurement sensitivity is positive measurement sensitivity of the impedance is positive which means that if the impedance is increasing the measured signal the voltage is increasing in those regions about where the two lead fields are normal to each other more or less normal to each other the measurement sensitivity is more or less zero and what is the surprising situation is that when these two lead fields are opposite in direction the measurement sensitivity is negative when the impedance is increasing the signal amplitude is decreasing this is something which, when, when we practically found this with the simulation tests, I'll show you the picture a bit later, was very uh, surprising. I, I just uh, didn't understand this. Uh, we recognized that that is the case, but we didn't understand how, how it is, uh, how the sensitivity may be negative. That is it only characteristic and typical only for impedance measurement? So we thought. I've been thinking about this and I tell you that it was uh, two weeks ago here when I found the solution for this. So I'm continuously developing and improving these lectures. It's two weeks ago when I found quite important issue in impedance measurement. I show you some slides. Maybe I should improve these. These are very new ones. The concept of negative sensitivity. This is not anything unique. This is just a general concept in measurement in bioelectric signals. So, think. The st think measurement of bioelectric activity. The signal from an impressed current source is proportional to the dot product of the lead field of the measurement lead and the source field. So this is the old equation which is 11.30 in the book from the measurement of of bioelectric activity, Ji, the impressed current density field. So the lead field is J sub Le, and the source field is, here is the one over sigma is in the integral, times Ji, where the Ji, the, uh, the uh, impressed current uh, density source field, is function of location and time. This is the measurement of bioelectric activity. The signal from an impedance measurement similarly is proportional to the dot product of the lead field of the measurement lead and the source field, just as Geselovic said. So this is the Geselovic equation. The lead field for the measurement lead J sub Le is here. And the source field is this current field which is fed with the other pairs of electrodes times 1 over sigma. And this is function of location and time. 
So you find surprisingly, it took a long time for me to find from my own book that these equations are exactly the same. E equations are exactly the same. Lead field or the measurement fields are the same. And source field is in, uh, in, in bioelectric measurement 1 over sigma times Ji. And impedance measurement 1 over sigma times the fed current field J sub Li. Exactly the same. It took a long time. I show you in practice. The same sentence as in the previous slide. The signal from an impressed current source is proportional to the dot product of the lead field of the measurement lead and the source field. So the source field is, for instance, in this case, when the cardiac activation takes place like this, uh, source field is the Ji, the depolarizing uh, cells in the, in the ventricles, Sigma is the conductivity uh, in, in, the, in the tissue. And this is one lead field, for instance, the lead one. And the signal is one over sigma times J sub Le, this lead field, dot J I D V. J I is here in the activation uh, depol depolarizing cells. And you find from the direction of the activation and the lead field that in these regions at this instant of time when the depolarization the activation is in the direction i have to show it this way because you see it on, on, the, on the screen in this direction which is the direction of the lead field it is a region of positive contribution at this instant of time and in those regions where the uh, ji is uh, primarily in opposite direction than the lead field. The contribution is negative. That gives a negative signal to the ECG. Just the same as in impedance measurement. And in impedance measurement, the blue box in the first slide, the signal from an impedance measurement is proportional to the dot product of the lead field of the measurement lead, the J sub LE, and the source field, which is 1 over sigma times JLI. We have the volume conductor. We have the J sub LI, the, the current field fed from outside. Lead field of the measurement lead, J sub LE. Region of positive contribution and region of negative contribution. Exactly the same. I'm still surprised why it took so long time for me to find that that's, that's exactly the case. Uh, there is so-called coal, coal plot of, for impedance. This is another issue. A useful method for illustrating the behavior of tissue impedance as a function of frequency. If here is a tissue impedance uh, uh, equivalent circuit, then as a function of frequency, the impedance behaves like this. If that is a negative reactance, and that is resistance. Uh, with a, uh, infinite frequency, uh, it is uh, impedance is R1, of course, because the capacity is uh, zero impedance. And with zero frequency, it is R1 plus R2. And tau is R2 times Z. So when f frequency, this is... Uh, how the plot looks for the zero frequency and when, uh, when the frequency is increasing, the total impedance behaves like that. Uh, in practice, the center of the semicircle is not necessarily on the real axis, but it is located beneath. Schwann is, uh, is a pioneer in impedance measurements and, and that's how he published it. So it is depressed, depressed coal coal plot looks like this. And here is some examples the depression, depression of the semicircle in the coal coal plots for the transverse and longitudinal impedances of skeletal muscle, longitudinal direction and transverse direction. In transverse, uh, with increasing frequency, the plot looks like that, and longitudinal like that. This is a way to illustrate the behavior of the impedance, tissue impedance, function of frequency. I go to impedance cardiography. 
This is technology which was developed in Minneapolis, University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, by Kinnan, Kubitschek and uh, Patterson. I know personally Robert Patterson quite well. This was developed for the NASA space projects to be able to measure physiological parameters from the astronauts. Uh, this was quite simple device when thinking from the point of view of, of present instruments. It had two pairs of electrodes, current feeding electrodes and voltage measurement electrodes. And the electrode was like a transparent tape, just which you have on your desk, transparent tape, where in the middle is a band of aluminium strip so that the transparent tape keeps it on the surface of the skin and the aluminium strip is, is the, the, the electrode itself. It is standardized that the electrodes are located in this way. Here is an important location. It is so-called xiphysternal joint. In the chest and the thorax, there's a sternum where the ribs are fixed. And there's an extension of the sternum, which is called xiphoid. And xiphysternal joint is just a joint between them. The current feeding electrodes are uh, placed uh, on the neck and lower on, on the thorax and voltage measurement electrodes in between also on the neck and just on the xiphysternal joint. This is a critical location. The current which is fed to the patient is AC current, 100 kilohertz, 4 milliamps, something like that. The patient does not feel anything. On the basis of principle of reciprocity, you understand that the current and voltage electrodes may be swept. It is just the same whether you feed the current from the outer pair and measure the voltage with the inner pair or other way around, feed the current with the inner pair and measure the voltage with the outer pair. The result is exactly the same. What kind of signals are measured with the voltage electrode? Firstly, of course, it is possible to record the ECG, AVF lead, that is recorded. Impedance is recorded and impedance of the thorax looks like that. Here is a, a point to, to, to and remember is that uh, this is shown upside down, this curve. When impedance is increasing, it goes down and when it is decreasing, it goes up just for some uh, historical reasons and for physiological reasons, something like this. And, uh, but please, it has to be known. And then here is shown an, a calibration signal which can be fed uh, to, the, to the voltage electrodes and measured with the uh, current electrodes and measured with the voltage electrode. Actually, the curve which is used in this analysis is the first time derivative of the impedance signal. Of course, the information in this first time derivative signal is exactly the same as in the, in the impedance curve. There's no information increased with the time derivative derivation, but it is easier to see what's going on in the signal. Uh, here is some points you see from this uh, uh, calibration signal, time derivative of the calibration signal, that it is the time derivative when the uh, impedance is changing with a constant rate, the time deriv derivative has a constant value. When the impedance is not changing, it goes, of course, to the zero and so on. The important uh, issue which is detected is dz over dt minimum which means that it is the maximum defle defle deflection of the signal, but it is called minimum, therefore that it is upside down. So that, that explains why it is minimum, even though it is uh, seen as a maximum. In the impedance time derivative, it can be uh, observed certain deflections, which are named A, B, X, Y, O, and Z. And there has been done a lot of experimental work to find out to which uh, cardiac events these are connected. And I show them there's also phonocardiogram is also recorded here. Uh, here is shown list uh, of the events in the cardiac cycle. 
Lababidian colleagues already in 1970 published this. This is, this is old data, but it, it is relevant data. A means atrial contraction. B is at the closure of tricuspid valve. Uh, X is at the closure of aortic valve. Y is closure of pulmonic valve. O is opening snap of mitral valve. And Z is third heart sound. So these are very well documented. There has been a lot of studies about the origin of the impedance signal, where it comes from. Here is some study by Penny, and he found that the pulmonary artery and lungs contribute about 60% of the signal. Aorta and thoracic cage muscles about 60%. Pulmonary vein and left atrium about 20%. Vena cava and right atrium about 20%. Well, if you quickly calculate that means, uh, means uh, 160%. But the left ventricle contributes minus 30% and right ventricle minus 30%, which makes 100%. Why these ventricles do have negative contribution? It's simple. This critical electrode is here on the xiphysternal joint above the ventricles and therefore the lead field in the ventricular region is in that orientation that it is negative sensitivity. Uh, how to calculate the e or derive the equation for the for the stroke volume, which is primarily calculated with the uh, impedance cardiography. Uh, I have a story here. It's a long story, but uh, let's make it short. It is modeled uh, the thorax with the region of, of blood, thorax, thoracic blood in the lungs and other tissue. And then finally, it is, I, I skip the derivation of the equation. It is here. I show it another way. The, Stroke volume equation is this, developed by Kinnan, Kubitschek and Patterson. Stroke volume, so the blood volume, what the heart pumps with one cycle, is blood resistivity, rho sub B, times L square, L is inner electrode distance, it is measured from the patient. Z square is the average impedance of the thorax, it is given by the instrument. DZ over DT minimum is the maximum deflection of the DZ over DT curve and T sub E is the ejection time. This is the equation. The instrument calculates that itself, but that's possible to calculate manually. How this equation comes? This is strange. Uh, Ejection time may be quite easily found from DZ over DT curve. I just show it manually found here. When the ejection begins, blood flows to the lungs and the aorta, and therefore the impedance which is measured on the thorax is decreasing because blood amount increases in the lungs impedance in the thorax is decreasing. Then already during the ejection time, at the latter part of the ejection time, blood already returns from the lungs to the left atrium and flows further in the aorta. Therefore the impedance is increasing already during the ejection time, at the end of the latter part of the ejection time. So it is measured for the impedance change, this change, which is from the maximum impedance to the minimum impedance, which is not at the end of the ejection time. And it is estimated what would be the change of the thorax impedance if it would change the whole ejection time as fast as it is changing with its maximum rate of change. And this is taken as a delta Z, DZ over DT minimum times ejection time. 
And this is taken as a change of the thorax impedance during the one stroke volume. This estimation is very speculative, which takes all the theoretical basis off from impedance cardiography. Despite of that, it is working very well, but this is shows that it is an indirect method, which causes some weaknesses. i just see how much I can have time today to speak about that. I speak, I, I think I can speak something about that today. Yeah. Well, uh, here are some, some primitive first analysis of Kinnan and colleagues, the developers of the instrument, about the lead fields in the thorax, very simple thorax volume conductor model. Here is some work made by Sakamoto and colleagues in Sofia University in Tokyo. I visited Sofia University as a visiting professor in, in the late 1993 and met Sakamoto and I was in Kanai's laboratory and saw this work there. He studied with this model what would be the origin of the impedance cardiography signal. We made at Tampere computer analysis, computer model analysis of the sensitivity distributions of impedance cardiography. It is, was made by Pasi Kauppinen in his PhD thesis. It was published in, in, in 98 in Annals of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, it, analysis was made with four different uh, impedance cardiography uh, uh, systems. The four-band electrode system, which is the original by Kinnan and Kubitschek and Patterson, four spot electrodes by Penny et al., eight spot electrodes by Bernstein, and nine spot electrodes with Voltier et al. And the result is here. This was the picture, illustration, which confused me because this was the first time when I observed that there is the negative sensitivity in the impedance measurement. You see that the red and yellow colors are positive sensitivity, blue, bluish colors are negative sensitivity, and the, most of the sensitivity is in that region where the, the blood is in the aorta. And, and uh, from these regions you find there is a lot of negative sensitivity. So this was a very confusing observation. I believe this, but I didn't understand why it is negative sensitivity. This is in 98, so it took 16 years until I two weeks ago found a solution to explain easily why there is a negative sensitivity. This is how the instrument looks like, the Minnesota impedance cardiograph. Here is shown the basic instrument, that there is the basic, uh, 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 the, the basic average impedance of the, of the thorax, and here is a calculator which does the uh, impedance calculation, which is optional uh, device. Here's some uh, another uh, manufacturer cardiograph, uh, and there is some sales promotion uh, material, historical method for invasive homo hemodynamic monitoring with a catheter, and here is how it is done well with the impedance cardiography, and the company BioZ uh, promotes its instrument with this kind of pictures. It's just quarter to 12, so I will tell you next time about the accuracy of the impedance cardiography and about impedance tomography, and then some other issues. I had very much hope that I had had uh, still more time to lecture, to repeat everything quickly what I have lectured during this course, but maybe next time I have a, a little bit time to do that also. So, the rest of impedance cardiography and what is important at Helmholtz Institute, the impedance tomography, will be discussed next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>